On today's show, the Atlanta Hawks fall at the hands of the Boston Celtics on this Sunday evening, and they're now down 3-1 in the first round series with Game 5 looming on Tuesday. We'll get into how it happened on the court, what was good for the Hawks, what was bad for the Hawks, how uh, they might be able to just sort of impact things in the future, and more on the way. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1458 of the Lawton Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you on a Sunday evening into Monday. And today's show is brought to you by Prize Picks. If you're first time user with Prize Picks, you can get a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code locked on. That is prizepicks.com, promo code locked on. And I also want to say at the top of the podcast, I definitely encourage you to make us your first listen each and every day. Check us out across podcast platforms. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, we're also on Google Play, Odyssey app, etc. on the audio side, and we're on YouTube on the video side. And today's show is going to get, break down what became a 129-121 to 121 loss for the Hawks as they fall behind 3-1 in the best of seven series against Boston. Obviously, that means a very slim margin for error, basically none at this point. The Hawks have to win out in the series, including two road games in order to steal the series. Obviously, astronomical odds of doing that. So a lot of people kind of morning the season i will not go that far at this point in time the season is not over for the hawks but certainly the odds are very long in atlanta's favor and they had to kind of uh win this one to probably make things more interesting in the series and they were not able to quite go ahead and do that they had a rough start in this game in my mind i actually burned them we'll come back to that later on they were down double digits for a large portion of the first half they did fight very hard and very valiantly from there they were within a couple points a few different times in this one in fact they were down by five points without four about four minutes to go in the fourth quarter, and then Boston scored the next seven points, including what I thought was probably the dagger of the night, a 32-foot three by Jason Tatum at the end of the shot clock to go up by 12. And the Hawks didn't roll over from there, but certainly it was uh, mostly academic at that point in time. We'll get into kind of how this game broke down. If you're a new listener, welcome aboard. Uh, I really appreciate you listening to the podcast. And if not, um, I really appreciate the uh, everyday listeners as well for jumping back on with us as they always do. So we'll get into this one as far as my observations on how the game actually happened and the overall performance in a second, but I want to start here. This is one of those things, like it's one of the more prominent things I think that you can kind of become more clear on a night like this. And it kind of already was in some respects, but even more so in the crucible of a basically a must-win game in a lot of ways. And the Hawks don't really have a five-man lineup that really works at the highest levels in crunch time, especially against a team like Boston that is constructed so well at this point. So this is a question that other teams have as well. Like Phoenix is a title contender. They have the same question. Do they have, who's their fifth guy is a, is a big question. Cleveland's had that question all year long. Even as a team that has, like, I, I, I would say, have like a top three net rating in the league this year, they don't really have a fifth guy. They have a top four. And the Hawks don't have a clear top four like that necessarily on the level of those teams, but they do have a little bit of a lineup construction problem, which we, we kind of knew that already, but it was kind of even more glaring in this game. Clearly, you'll always have Trey and DeJounte on the floor together, and I think DeAndre Hunter played very well tonight. He's kind of the most natural wing forward to have on the floor because of his defense. And then you have a center, either a Kongwu or Capella. So that's four-fifths of the roster as far as the lamps and and crunch time usually for this Hawks team. The fifth spot was sort of a mixture of ugliness on this particular night. So you have Bogey as the offense only really option, but they number one, he fouled out in this game. They were actually going to try Bogey at the end of the game, but he ended up fouling out. But they're so small if they do that. And then defensively, Bogey, especially at the three, is not great. You have Sadiq Bey, a better offensive option than some. And he was really good in game three. That's who they closed with in game three. That was the right decision. That was the right move. He was really awesome. But in this game, he was not good overall, uh, especially on defense where I thought he was probably their worst defender, which is on a team with Trey Young and et cetera. That's not great. And then offensively, he didn't really have it going in this game either. So um, on a night like in game three, when he had it rolling, it was easy. You just kind of go with Sadiq Bay. But on this ga- in this game, he did not have that same option, and they went away from him as a result. Then you have John Collins, who is easily the best defender of this group, but a guy who has not been able to find a shot in the series. And really all year long, he, had a, he, he shot the ball better in the second half of the year after the All-Star break, but is not been getting the respect of Boston's defense as a shooter. It's always important to keep in mind that like Collins' best role is not really even being used on this team offensively. He's an awesome, like literally elite level pick and roll finisher, but on a team with Capella and Congo, he doesn't really get to do that. It's because more of a, of a force spacer and in that pure role, if he's not making shots, it's really hard. And then you throw in Jalen Johnson as that kind of the option. Like I will not, I'll just say this: the future is very bright for Jalen Johnson. He's not quite ready for that role. So 
Anyway, that's four different options at the four, basically, or maybe at the three if you want to go with Hunter at the four. And in contrast, Boston has multiple ways to do this that work really well with a bunch of two-way guys, basically. They can go small. They can go with two bigs. They have Taylor Brown. They have Marcus Smart. They have Derek White, etc. Their top seven players are all at least average defensive players, which makes it a lot easier in a lot of ways. Most of them are above average defenders. Tatum, Robert Williams, Al Horford, Marcus Smart, Derek White. Those guys are all above average to even awesome defenders. The Hawks don't have a luxury. They have a lot of offensive first players and the guys who are their better defenders in this series, basically their centers, uh, you know, maybe throwing Hunter, obviously throwing Collins a little bit, um, are not always two-way guys, at least in every single matchup. So anyway, I don't want to go that rabbit rab- 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 hole too much. And just I'll just say this now, I am not going to do the post-mortem just yet about rosters. And like I understand why everybody's doing that. It's the season sort of uh, apex at this point in time of like who, who needs to go. and who's. It's a very natural fan reaction. That will be plenty of time for that later on. But the Hawks don't have the luxury. And basically, they it was pretty glaring to me that while they wouldn't have won the game anyway necessarily, they could have, certainly. Um, they just couldn't have that perfect lineup to use in this game. And it was very obvious to me and others, and it became a pretty large takeaway as a result. Um, offensively in this game, they played fairly well at times. They had a 116 offensive rating. That's very solid. They did well in a possession battle in this game, but yet they were not able to shoot the ball as, as well. And I thought that Quinn Snyder said it in pregame. Um, before game four, and then Trey Young said it after game four, basically just contrasting game three and game four. Like in game three, there was more than this. I was the first to say that. And by the way, if you missed miss that podcast, I, I, I sort of did an, an audio, audio only show on Friday night. It was very clear to me that like a lot of the reason, not the whole reason that they were willing to go on, on in game three is because they shot the heck out of the ball. They made everything. The bench was awesome. Bay and Boki in particular, they made a lot of shots in game three. And that's, that's fine. Sometimes that's going to happen. But in game four, they played similarly on offense. They did a lot of things well. They just didn't make as many shots. And it wasn't only that, but it certainly was important to me. Uh, if sort of, you sort of watch the game and also look at the box score, they were 28 out of 72 outside of four feet in the game. They were 9 of 24 on floaters. That's very bad, like 35-ish percent. They were okay on long twos, not, not a huge great ratio there. And then 14 of 37 on threes. Like not, that's, not, that's not disastrous. That's 38%. But the, the Florida range misses were rough, and they just were not very efficient in this game. They got to the line more than they have been. They did a good job protecting the ball. So, like, they won on the margin. They, they took more shots than Boston did in this game. But after just not making the same level of shots, that was kind of the difference. And really, like, it wasn't just this, but the bench, after, like, they kind of went nuclear in game three. I talked about Bay earlier and how he closed the game. But Bay and Bogey in particular, and even Jalen Johnson, were all making shots at game three. Tonight, Bay and Bogey were 5 15 from the floor and two of, eight, two of eight from three. And you can't rely on your bench guys, your reserves, your supporting pieces to be awesome all the time, but they had to be in this series when you're, when you're playing a team that's better than you, and they weren't in this spot. Uh, and then, you know, defensively, it's not a huge surprise. If you've if you're watching the podcast for a while or listening to the podcast or watching the Hawks, generally speaking, it was mostly at the point of attack. The Celtics had a 122 offensive rating in the game. They shot very well from the floor, very well from three. They got to the line 25 times. They got to the paint kind of ad nauseum in this one. And I think the point of attack defensively was a mess. Um, we'll, we'll get into the individual, individual player breakdowns later on, but Steve Bay had really struggled. I thought DeJounte Murray was quite bad defensively in this game, despite the fact he played well on offense. You know, Trey's always a weakness on the, on the perimeter, bogey, et cetera. A lot of free runs to the rim. The one guy I thought played better than he had been the rest of the series defensively was DeAndre Hunter. But, uh, you, know, you know, the backcourt stuff has been well documented, but it's been their biggest problem all year long, in my, in my, in my opinion. Is it their only problem? No, it's not. But it is their biggest, most, most consistent problem, both roster-wise and also just execution-wise. They just do not hold up at the point of attack, and it really hurt them in this game. Almost half of Boston shot attempts happened at the rim, which means that they're getting to the rim unmolested. Basically, they're just able to drive by the point of attack, and yes, the, the help gets there, but when you already have a head of steam and you're really good, like, like Boston's guys are, that's not going to be able to get it done. So we'll leave it there now. But honestly, it was kind of a two-way loss. Like neither end of the floor was a disaster for the Hawks in this game. They were pretty frisky on offense. They have been worse at times in the series defensively than they were in this game, but it just wasn't good enough on the whole. And yes, the Hawks were seven and a half point underdogs in this game. They ended up losing by eight. So basically FanDuel, our friends over there, nailed the line. That was what this game was in a lot of ways. Boston, once they had Marcus Smart, who was actually questionable to play in this game, once he was able to go, 
they were at full strength. And uh, kind of the uh, the zigzag theory, how, how you want to say that, the Hawks winning game three, uh, sort of a lot of people thought that this was going to be a, a good Boston game, and, and it was. They, they played very well. The Hawks didn't embarrass themselves in this game. I, I saw a lot of frustration after the fact. I get it. I thought the first quarter, as we'll get into in a second, was really their weak point in this one. Um, that's kind of, if you have frustration in this game about how the Hawks played, I would direct you to the start of the game. Once they kind of snapped out of that, they played pretty well. And yes, it was at home. Boston's better than you. All that fun stuff. We'll get into kind of how it all happened game flow wise, individual player breakdowns, but it was a two-way loss. Um, both ends of the floor had some questions. The stars were good for the Hawks. You can't really ask for too much more from Trey and DeJounte, at least on offense in this game. DeAndre Hunter had a big one for Atlanta, but the supporting pieces didn't really have it in this game, and that leads to a loss. And now, obviously, a very uphill battle when it comes to the rest of the series. Okay, we'll get into how this game unfolded in a second. But first, a word from our sponsors on the show today. Today's show is brought to you by the award-winning app at Prize Picks. Prize Picks Daily Fantasy made easy. It is amazing. I know that you will love it as well. It's really easy to use. You can pick two to six players, but actually choose whether they have more or less than a certain number of points or rebounds or assists or other stats across the board. And Prize Picks points to 25 times your money on your entries. That's a lot of fun, of course. And they offer sport, numbers on sports that you might enjoy across the board, not just basketball, but football, baseball, etc. A whole entry can be made just a minute or less. It's that easy and quick. Plus, it's just you against the numbers with Prize Picks. They have safe and pass withdrawals. And every day during the NBA playoffs, one user at Prize Picks will have the chance to wake, actually become a millionaire. One entry placed after 8 a.m. Eastern Time will be randomly selected each day. And whoever placed that entry is going to be given a six pick flex with the following payouts. If you get all six right, it'll be a million dollars for you. Five, five correct, correct picks, $80,000, four correct picks, $16,000, and so on. Full details can be found at prizepicks.com slash million. You must opt in at that link to be eligible for the million-dollar entry. That is prizepicks.com slash million. Once you opt in, all you have to do is actually go and play the game like normal, and you might be the lucky winner. Download the app right now at prizepicks. Or go to prizepicks.com slash play daily fantasy sports right now. And by the way, also, if you're a first-time user, you get a 100% instant deposit match with prizepicks up to $100 if you use the promo code locked on. That's promo code locked on. For instant, instant deposit match up to $100 with prize picks. Check it out right now and don't forget prizepicks.com slash million. Today's show is brought to you by Nissan and Nissan's most electric player of the week is also brought to you by the all new all electric 2023 Nissan Aria. This week's choice is going to be Trey Young and Trey is of course fantastic and the Nissan Aria is brilliantly fierce, fiercely elegant and suddenly powerful bringing an impressive combination of Trey's to the table. It's the perfect crossover and Trey had a big time game on Sunday evening 35 points and 15 assists for Trey to go along with one turnover. He didn't shoot the ball incredibly well, but it was more than enough. The passing was all over the place in a good way. And also he, by the way, had 32 points and nine assists on Friday. So Trey gets the nod this time around with Nissan. And uh, he was not the only guy who had a chance to win that award. In fact, DeAndre Hunter was in the mix as well, but Trey was fantastic in this game. Nissan Aria packs power. They'll actually pin you to your seat. And they also have premium intelligence all in one EV. The all new, all electric 2023 Nissan Aria is EVP people people love to drive? Shop now at NissanUSA.com. All right, we'll dive in now to how this game kind of unfolded. What we do here is kind of go through my notes throughout the contest about how like the, n- the numbers and sort of the notable plays. And uh, early on, the Hawks did have a catch and shoot three from, from Hunter at the very, very start of the game, but it was a 9 0 run by Boston early on in the first quarter. They were pushing tempo, I thought, pretty much down the Hawks' throats early on in this game. They had two layups, a pair of free throws early on as well. The Hawks did have their own 8 0 run with a lot of pace of their own. Murray had a couple of threes, but Boston had another 12 0 run. So they had 9 0 run and a 12 0 run in the first like eight minutes to the Celtics. The Hawks had a, a streak where they actually went empty on eight consecutive possessions, what about four minutes without, without scoring at all? Uh, John Collins had a really rough start to this one on offense. I think he was, he was not the only problem at all, by the way. And I think he's getting probably a little bit too much of the, of the blame um, from Hawks fans at this point in time, but he was not good in this one on offense at all. He was 0 4 to start the game. The Hawks were two of 10 on two point shots at the outset. Um, rotation wise, it was kind of the usual stuff from Atlanta. They were down by 14 points in the first quarter. And look, as we said before, like this is a, a situation where the Hawks have to play very well to even be competitive in these games. Boston is better than them. So when you come out of the gate and you don't play well and you're down 14 because you're struggling with attention to detail, like just mental breakdowns. And I think defensively, they made so many mistakes. It was very obvious on, on the film if you watch it back, but like, intently just like rotation issues and just not competing at times and um and unlike game three that wasn't covered up by the shot making so the hawks had some defensive issues along the way and offensively a little bit of a slow start and suddenly you look up and you're down by 14 points in the first quarter 
Um, Trey had a step back late at uh, uh, last possession of the first quarter to get back within 10, but still down 10 offensively while making five threes is pretty tough. They were four 14 on twos. Murray did have 11 points early on, but they were uh, losing the possession battle as well. Boston wasn't going crazy with their shot making just yet, but uh, they were the better team early on. The Hawks, um, didn't have that same magic from the bench in this game. Generally speaking, they missed their first six, six of his first seven shots. There was a nice gift from Malcolm Brogdon, who has been um, in the crosshairs of Hawks fans the last few days. Uh, he missed a flat-out bunny layup on a fast break. It was wild. and actually led to a three-point play by the Hawks. So that was actually a nice little break for Atlanta. Um, Boston also tried old friend Mike Muscala for some reason in this game when they could have gone to Grant Williams. And in fact, Boston, uh, the Hawks just attacked him mercilessly, and he was pulled in like 80 seconds. It was kind of a weird play. Weird stretch of plays, I should say. Um, it was a 9 run by the Hawks late in the first half where um, Derek White had an extremely odd moment in the middle of the lane during that during that stretch. Collins kind of bothered him a little bit um, on a shot to sort of deter it. Then White seemingly almost forgot he was staying in the lane and turned it over on, three, on a three-second call. Then Collins did a three in the next possession, then had a block on the next possession. So it was honestly by far Collins' best stretch of the game. And then led to a monster dunk by DeAndre Hunter. And suddenly the Hawks were within four and like the building's alive, all that fun stuff. But then, of course, kind of in typical Hawks fashion, if you watch the team all year long, they've been pretty maddening at times. And at the end of the first half was one of those times. They were down seven with about 45 seconds to go in the first half. And they had the ball. They had a three in the air, in fact, to, that would have got the Hawks back within four in the final minute. But from there, they allowed a dunk, another miss, and then a three. And it was almost a four-point play. In fact, Quinn Snyder challenged a play. It was calling a foul on the floor to send Smart to the line. Um, in retrospect, I didn't love the challenge because the they did win the challenge, I should say that, but the basket ends up counting. So it was essentially a one-point swing, and I probably wouldn't do that in the first half. Now, the counter would be, of course, there was at least a chance, I would imagine, in their mind that they were going to have the entire play overturned because Smart kind of initiated the contact a little bit. Anyway... It happened, and basically the half ends on a little mini run by Boston to go up by 12 at the halftime break. Um, it was twelve. It was sorry, a 12-4 run at the end of the first half. And look, it was kind of a microcosm of the rest of the game, just not quite enough on either end of the floor. I will say Hunter had 17 in the first half, was very good. Um, but otherwise, the offense was kind of middling, much better after halftime. Defensively, not great either. Um, after the half, it was better. They played with a good pace, a 14-7 run, got the ball moving a lot. Trey was able to find Capella for two different lobs in the first like three minutes. They had five dunks or layups in the first like four minutes of the, of the third quarter, 14 points, uh, zooming out of the gate. Um, Tatum then got fouled by Trey and Capella sort of in transition, went down hard. He was clearly upset by it. And I think Porter was as well. If you watch the replay, Tatum got up and was pretty demonstrative. And that kind of prompted, I think, an official review of the play ended up being a flagrant one. Um, it was upgraded, I think, maybe by the letter of the law. It could have been a flagrant one. It seemed like pretty soft, honestly, as far as that call was concerned. But anyway, I just want to at least note that. The Stars did win their minutes and cut it in the margin. Um, that's been a theme, by the way, in this series. As much as people don't seem to understand that's been happening, the starting lineup has still been fine in this series. Like, it's been um, kind of everything else that's gone wrong for the Hawks at times. But anyway, the Hawks cut the rotation down. No Jalen Johnson after halftime. That was, for me, an okay, an okay decision. Honestly, he was not fantastic in the first half. Um, they, they, they rode Hunter a lot. Hunter had 27 points on his first 15 shooting positions in this game. Uh, unfortunately, he was scoreless in the fourth quarter, but he was really good through three. Um, Bogey had a three late in the third, and uh, despite the fact that Marcus Smart blew by him for a dunk on the next possession, the Hawks were within five again, and they cut the lead down from double digits down to five, and they were right there on the doorstep. They shot 60% from the field in the third quarter with 11 assists. So the Hawks had 25 in the whole game. So almost half of them happened in the third quarter. Good ball movement all, along the way. Hunter stayed in, actually, starting the fourth quarter. And I kind of mused aloud, like, is he going to play the entire second half? Um, that didn't happen, but he only sat for about a minute. Hunter played 40 minutes in this one, uh, along with Trey and Ajante. They were really pushing in, trying to get the win for obvious reasons. I thought Conway played really well early in the fourth quarter on the glass, extra possessions, etc. They went with Hunter uh, at the four at times, along with the three perimeter creators, which is, of course, Trey and Bogey and Murray. Uh, but defensively, that group, as referenced earlier, had a lot of trouble. They tried Bogey again. Uh, he, he got his fifth foul, came out of the game. They went to Bay for, for a brief minute, and they went to Collins again. And then Bogey got his fifth, uh, his sixth foul, and they went back to Collins. So basically, it seemed like at the end, uh, Quinn was going to lean on Bogey if he could. And then when Bogey was unavailable, they went to Collins because they just didn't trust Bay. And 
I honestly agree with all of that, I think. Because they were down by 10, I probably would have leaned to bogey too. They tried that. He fought out immediately. But I think Collins was better than Bay as much as he's getting a lot more heat. And I get why he's the bigger name and bigger contract, all that stuff. But I think Collins was better than Bay in this game. It's just the fact that um, it was because of defense. Both guys were off, were bad on offense. And then one of those guys is a good defender and the other one's not. So that's kind of was, I think, what Snyder went to at the end. People kind of asked that question. Like, it seemed pretty simple to me. It seemed like Quinn probably knew that neither option was great and they chose defense over offense. And you could argue with that. I get it. But there you go. Anyway. Um, at the end, they were down by five with um, you know about 8.30-ish to go. Um, then it got down to uh, eight again with like five and a half minutes to go, but it was five again with four minutes left. Uh, and that was after Bogey had fouled out. Then Boston got a layup for Robert Williams, back-to-back possessions because perimeter defense was still a problem. Once again, um, Murray was getting beat off the dribble repeatedly. Um, they did trade some buckets, and then Tatum got to the line. And with 2.40 to go, the Hawks were down by nine again. It was a little bit teetering there. And then um, the Hawks did force a shot that was tough at the end of the shot clock. And this is the one that I think I said before was the biggest dagger. Tatum made a 32-footer at the buzzer of the shot clock to go up by 12. And while Trey did answer it with a 30-footer of his own, John Brown made another three right, right back to that. So it wasn't like it was really ever close from that point. They were, they were down by 9 or 12. There was a free bucket given to the Hawks after Boston turned over the backcourt, but it was nullified from there. And um, honestly, the most interesting thing at the end of the game was – Unfortunate in some ways, DeJounte Murray was captured on camera. And I'm sure if you're a Hawks fan, you might have seen this by now on social media. But he kind of got into it with an official at the very end. Looks like there might have been some contact, which is usually a pretty big no-no between player and official. We'll see how that's sort of litigated at the end of this. People keep asking me if if he's going to be suspended. I don't have the answer. I would guess no, but it's not impossible. I I would call it a non-zero chance that Murray could be suspended for game four, uh, sorry, for game five, if they find something weird there. If not, it could be a fine, but uh, a big shrug right now as I'm recording this podcast late in the night on Sunday and Monday. Not a great look by anybody involved there, but there you go. And I get it. Hawks fans were um, kind of maybe agreeing with Murray at the end of the game. I get it, but I'll just say, like, you can't do that. If you're you're Murray and you're, you know, the game's over, but you got to know this is a series. You can't have any doubt there. So I get the frustration. I think the Hawks got some bad whistles in this game, uh, but that wasn't why they lost. And frustration kind of boils over. I get all that, but we'll come back to it later on if we need to, uh, as, especially if there's uh, any sort of discipline handed out between now and game five. We'll pause there and we'll come back in a second with our individual player thoughts in this game, as, and as well as a brief look ahead to what's to come on the schedule for Atlanta. But first, though, a word from our sponsors on the podcast. <laughs> Ultimate Pro Basketball GM is the coolest game that I have played in a very long time. And like a lot of people, I grew up wanting to be sort of a NBA front office person. I was not going to be playing in the NBA, probably at that point in time. I kind of knew that. But being a GM, something like that, would be a lot of fun. It turns out, though, not all that easy to do that. If you've had some time in the past where you actually pictured this stuff, now you could actually go in and actually do your own stuff in the franchise mode. Go download Ultimate Basketball GM right now. You're responsible for hiring the right coaches and training players and dealing with personalities within the franchise, making draft picks, and generally navigating life in, through free agency and all the fun challenges of a season. It all happens in a realistic game world, and also Ultimate Pro Basketball GM is completely free and playable offline. You can play on the go whenever you want to, as much as you want to, and we're also having fun behind the scenes, talking trash to each other in a lot of podcast network group chats and really having a lot of fun with the entire program. It's an awesome way to connect with your friends, especially if they are diehards like you are. And if you're listening to this podcast, as you are, get 100% free boost to the franchise when you go to uh, promo code locked on inside the game store of the Ultimate Pro Basketball GM. Double the game right now by visiting probasketballgm.com where you can scan the code or look it up in the app store. That is probasketballgm.com. And when you get there, use that promo code locked on. Ultimate Pro Basketball GM, start your dynasty today. <laughs> All right, we'll close the show with our individual player evaluations in this spot. Uh, I'll go to the bench first, and it was pretty heavy starter minutes in this game, so not a lot to get to. But Jalen Johnson, six minutes, all in the first half, two points, two rebounds, had an assist and a steal. I thought he played better than he has at times in the series, but I, I do understand not going back to him. People kind of ask that question. I, I understand why Hawks fans want to see him. I also understand why the Hawks didn't put him back in. And you could argue that it would be good to maybe try him more because of the way that Collins and Bay were playing. I'd be okay with that, but it seems like, and this is a very natural thing around the NBA, if you're down in a playoff series, especially in a, basically, this is for your season. I'm not saying the season's over, but if you're the Hawks, you should have treated this game down 2-1 like it was your season, because if you lose, you're down 3-1 with two games in Boston. I think Quinn treated it that way, and that usually means 
trimming rotation down. And that means that Joe Johnson as the ninth man plays less. I was okay with that, but there you go. I thought they played fine when he was out there, but uh, I, I get, and I think I support broadly speaking, him not playing in the second half. Bogey just couldn't, couldn't stay on the floor. Um, 19 minutes for Bogey, and that's not what they wanted to do. The Hawks wanted to play him more in this game, but he fought out 19 minutes. That's tough. Um, eight points on eight shots. He wasn't like fantastic, but uh, obviously he has a lot of juice offensively at times, and they probably would have used him more if they could have, but um, the fouls were just kind of piling up on him for whatever reason. Um, Akongwu had the same problem, five fouls in 18 minutes for Akongwu. That's more on brand. Akongwu is a high foul player, whereas Bogey really isn't. And Akongwu had three turnovers in the game, kind of shaky. He was good early in the fourth, I thought, but it was not his best performance. And I think that's probably what led Capella to play a lot more. Usually it's been a little bit more close in minutes, but in this one it was Capella for about 30-31 and Akongwu for about 17 or 18. That was fine with me, honestly, because I think Capella was better in the game. Uh, it talks about Bay before, but Bay, five points on seven shots, 0-3 from three, two of four on twos, three rebounds. Um, defensively, I mean, I, I don't want to overdo it and be too negative. I thought he's been better at times recently defensively, but it was back to where he was early on in his Hawks tenure. It was really rough today. Um, Nikaias Duncan, who is a national figure, basketball news, been on this podcast before. Um, I love Nikaias' work. He immediately noticed it, and I, I backed him up on that as well, like, Boston, I think, figured out that they could put Bay in, in an action and get whatever they wanted to. And that's not unique to him. Obviously, that's been the case for Trey for a long time. It's been like, you know, teams will look when they need to to kind of pick on him. I think DeJounte has been similar in some ways this year, but they were, uh, I think, it was pretty flagrant to me that they were trying to go after Bay. I think Snyder knew it, and that's why he didn't play more in the game. But offensively, he didn't have it either. It, it, it would have been different if Bay had a good offensive game, but he didn't. And then defensively, it was kind of a mess. Um, to the starters. Uh, Capella had 30 minutes again, 10 points, seven rebounds, two steals, a block for Clint. He wasn't his absolute best, but he was fine. I think defensively he did a pretty good job. He was net, he was net neutral in the plus minus in this game. Uh, Collins had a rough one on offense. I thought he was better after the first quarter, but the first quarter was really bad. I think people like I'm, I have no defense of that. I think he was 0-4 with a turnover or something like that in the first, and one of nine in the game, uh, five points, five rebounds, then an assist and a and a block shot. Um, I've said it before. I know Glenn did as well on the same podcast. I think John has been a good defensive player in the series. Um, that doesn't matter to a lot of fans. I get that defense is not as uh, visible or as um, I don't know cared for by fans as offense, but there's no way around it. Collins has hurt them on offense in the series. No question about it. It's been a weird journey because Collins used to be really an offense only player and he kind of became more of a balanced player. And now and at least this year, I think probably overall because of his shooting struggles has been more of a defensive player. But uh, they could have used him making some shots in this game, and he just didn't do it. So uh, between Bay and Collins, uh, that combination was untenable. They had they had to have one of those guys play well in this game. And I thought Collins' defense was certainly the best trait of any of uh, any of those two guys. If you say, you know, Bay offense, Bay defense, Collins offense, Collins defense, definitely Collins defense was, was the best. But the Hawks could not afford to have both those guys struggle, and they did in this game. Uh, Hunter had a great, had a really good game. Uh, he did cool off in the fourth quarter, didn't score, but 27 points to uh, – he actually had more points than anybody but Trey on the roster. Um, seven rebounds as well. Nice to see that from him. Uh, he had a block and a steal. I thought he was pretty good defensively on Tatum. Not incredible, but certainly better than he's been in the rest of the series. So it was good to see DeAndre De- 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 play well. I kind of joked during the series – during the game tonight. It was one of those games that, like, if you don't watch the Hawks – this happened once last year in the Miami series. Like people think that Hunter is like a star. If you just, if you just watch tonight, he played very well though. Um, that was good to see, and he was one of the reasons why the Hawks were in this game along the way. And then the Hawks got enough, especially on offense, from Trey and Dejounte. You know, Dejounte had twenty three points, nine rebounds, six assists, um, had a block and a steal, nine of twenty from the floor, four of eight from three. Um, I played well. I think Dejounte on offense. I will def- emphasize that one more time. On offense in this series has been exactly what the Hawks wanted him to be. He's been able to carry the. He's been able to carry the load. He's made jumpers. He's taken threes. That's good to see. Um, that's kind of what it's been designed to do to kind of offset the pressure on Trey. He's done a very good job with that on offense. On defense, I've said it all year. I feel like I'm, I'm a broken record in some respects, but um, he has not been what the Hawks were hoping he would be defensively. I'll leave it there for now. But if you watch the tape, it's pretty obvious. Point of attack stuff just getting blown by by Brogdon and White and Smart and Brown. It doesn't really matter who it is. Just not sliding, not competing enough defensively. And, yeah, he played 40 minutes. It's hard to ask these guys to do that all the time. But uh, I've been disappointed all year by his defense. It was still the case, still the case here, and that was uh, that was definitely impactful. And I thought Trey was really good, honestly. 35 points, 15 assists, one turnover. Like, that's 
you can you can kind of stop there. Trey's passing was just fantastic in this game. He got to the line 11 times. He was 4 of four, 10 on threes. That's a good development. In fact, in fact, he took 10 and made four of them. Um, not fantastic from two, but not terrible. 726. So he was efficient enough as a score. The passing was fantastic. Defensively, it's not great always, but I thought Trey was really good in this game and they kind of wasted um, that one. Like to get what they got from Trey, DeJounte, and, Mer- and, uh, and Hunter in this game on offense. It combined, I believe it was doing about 85 points for those three guys, and it wasn't enough. It just tells you how little they got from everybody else, and that was the case. And then defensively, I'd said it before, but the point of attack stuff was a mess, and I uh, believe it there for now. So from here, the Hawks have a pretty difficult challenge. Uh, that goes without saying, obviously, if you look at the kind of just the history of all of what's going on here. Um, by the way, as I'm recording this podcast, uh, I, I referenced it before, but um, Tim Montemps, my friend of, from ESPN, reports that the NBA is, quote, investigating DeJounte Murray's actions toward officials at the end of game four on Sunday night. So that's another step. It's a national reporter. So the NBA is getting into that. We'll see how that kind of transpires, but not great with the Hawks there. Anyway, as far as the game is, is concerned, the next one on the agenda is game five in Boston on Tuesday. Our friends at FanDuel, uh, have the odds in the series. I, I almost hesitate to even say them out loud because they've taken basically the the betting off of the board. In fact, uh, this series is now a minus 650 favorite to finish in game five. That means that Boston is going to be basically a giant favorite to win game five. And then I'll also have two games after that. So um, yeah, I think everyone kind of assumes where this is going. I will never be one to close the door and say anything is 100% until it's 100%. That's just kind of, that's just kind of my style. And uh, I think if you're listening to the podcast before, you will know this, but I'm also not someone who's going to make like these rash declarations. It's not really what I'm going to do. I'm not going to be a hot take guy. I kind of tell you what I see. I try to be even, even, even keel with all that stuff. But just to be frank at the end of the podcast, the Hawks are not in good shape here. Obviously they have to win two games on the road in Boston. Plus they have to win at home. That is not likely to happen. We'll see if they respond in game five. Um, Oftentimes, I won't say always, but a lot of times a team that is overmatched as the Hawks are in the series will uh, have kind of a more of a blowout loss in game five on the road. Um, I'll be interested to see how they perform in that game and see if they compete more than you would expect. Um, But we'll see. And we'll get into all that later on. But the Hawks will be big favorites. Sorry, big underdogs in that game. In fact, I'm looking now to see what the number is. If they even have a a betting betting line out for that game. Yes, they do. The Hawks are plus 11. So they're 11 point underdogs. That paints the picture pretty clearly of what's expected in that spot, but uh, we'll go from there. If the Hawks are able to win on 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 sorry on Tuesday in Boston, they would come home and play Game Six on Thursday in Atlanta. So circle that one if you are intrigued by that possibility. And uh, by the way, if you're listening to this podcast, you might not know this. I do not stop doing the podcast as soon as the season ends. We'll kind of pivot into um, sort of you know overarching opinions and analysis of what transpired during the season and player evaluations as well as like, you know, roster takeaways and salary cap stuff. And we also get into the draft very heavily. The draft is about two months away at this point. So we'll have much of that to discuss. The Hawks have two picks in the draft, including a first round pick. So long story short, stay tuned for more on the podcast, no matter what the result of the game is on Tuesday. We'll have exit interviews from there, et cetera. So please subscribe to this podcast. Check us out across podcast platforms, Apple, Spotify, uh, you know, Google Play, Odyssey app, leave five-star ratings and reviews. Also spread the word to your friends who might enjoy this podcast if you're Hawks fans. We're also on YouTube where you can like like and subscribe the podcast. And uh, yeah, I do appreciate all of everyone listening to the show. Follow us on Twitter at Lothon Hawks. Follow me on Twitter at BT Roland. Follow my written work on the Hawks at patreon.com slash BT Roland. I do appreciate everybody listening to the podcast. We'll see you later on in the week.